Good morning. What makes a great love story? What makes a great love story? For some people, it's the characters involved. For some people, it's the chemistry. For some people, it's the setting. For some people, it's the obstacles that they overcome on their way to true love. My wife and I, every now and then, will watch a romantic comedy together. I'm actually not as opposed to them as many guys are, but she's not as interested in them as many ladies are, so we don't have to watch a lot, but she likes some of the older ones. She loves uh, You've Got Mail, Sleepless in Seattle, and uh, While You Were Sleeping, lots of movies about sleeping, but she, she, likes, <laughs> she likes those movies, and I've seen enough romantic comedies to realize that the plot is pretty predictable, right? Boy meets girl, usually from opposite sides of the track, or there's something very different about their lives, and they come together, and they start liking each other. And, but their relationship is initially built on some sort of half-truth or lie that remains hidden, but still the relationship grows stronger and stronger. And then at the climax of the movie, some, uh, somehow dramatically and predictably, the truth is exposed, and it seems to end the relationship. And then, like, the key moment in every romantic comedy is this 90-second montage of them being sad and lonely with some some indie song playing in the background. (laughs) And then, uh, usually through the help of their funny sidekick buddy, uh, they realize that the other person's not so bad, and they, they end up accepting each other for who they really are, and then they live happily ever after. That's kind of the plot of every single romantic comedy I've, I've ever seen. Well, this morning I actually want to talk to you about the worst love story ever. The worst love story ever. And it's found, I think, in Genesis chapter 29. In Genesis chapter 29, we see a story about two sisters, two rival sisters, a lovesick man, and we learn how he ended up married to both of them. Genesis chapter 29, the worst love story ever. Let me just back up a little bit to give us a little context on this story. In Genesis chapter 12, God chooses a man named Abraham. Eventually his name is changed to Abraham. And he says, Abraham, I want to establish a covenant with you. And the covenant is I'm going to be your God and and you and your descendants will be my people. And I want to bless the entire world through you and your descendants. And he speaks to Abraham many times in covenants in the book of Genesis in the language of blessings and cursings. He says, those who bless you, I will bless, and those who curse you, I will curse. And so this idea of blessing becomes a big deal in the story of the people of God. God chooses Abraham and blesses him and says, I'm going to bless all your descendants through you. In fact, he tells Abraham, you're going to have so many children, they're going to be as countless, so many descendants, they're going to be as countless as the stars in the sky. Of course, God has a way of doing things differently than we would expect, and Abraham is 100 years old before he has his first, I guess what we would call legitimate son. And that son's name is Isaac. And Isaac gets the blessing from Abraham. Well, Isaac ends up marrying a woman named Rebekah, and Isaac and Rebekah have twins, twin boys named Esau and Jacob. Esau and Jacob are uh, rivals also, striving with each other before they're born, in the womb, as they're being born, after they're born, fighting each other, really fighting for the blessing that Isaac has to give to them. But in this culture, it always went, or at least the majority of it went to the oldest son. And Esau, although they were just minutes apart, or seconds apart, uh, Esau was born first. So he was going to get the blessing. However, Jacob comes up with a plan, and he tricks his father into giving him the blessing. So now this blessing that God has promised in Genesis 12 from Abraham to Isaac is stolen by Jacob. And Esau, as you might expect, is not happy at all. And Esau says to Jacob, listen, buddy, out of respect for dad, as long as he's alive, you'll be alive. But when we go to bury him, you better dig another hole because I'm going to kill you. And he's not speaking metaphorically. (laughs) Literally, I'm going to end your life. And so Isaac eventually dies, and Jacob decides I better get out of town. So Jacob takes off running, and this is where we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 29. Jacob meets a man named Laban, and Laban has two daughters. His daughters are named Leah and Rachel. Leah is the older sister, and Rachel is the younger sister. And the Bible gives us a very interesting comparison between the two. Often when we're trying to compare things, we we stay on the same spectrum. So this person's tall, this person is short. This person is thin, and this person is 
My favorite word is husky. This person is husky. That's what I like to call myself, husky. This person is husky. So we, those comparisons make sense because you got, it, you got opposite ends of the same spectrum. But in Genesis 29, they give us a comparison that seems to not make sense at all. They say that Rachel, the younger sister, was beautiful in face and in form. Face and form, she's striking. She's, she's beautiful. But Leah has weak eyes. It's like, what? What does that have to do? What does one have to do with the other? And most uh, biblical scholars think that what the author of Genesis was saying is that there was actually something about Leah's eyes that made her unattractive, in that culture at least. There was something about her eyes that made her not, certainly not as attractive as Rachel. So for whatever it was, and we don't know exactly what it was, Rachel, the younger sister, is beautiful. Leah, the older sister, has weak eyes. And Jacob goes after, you know, he's a guy, he goes after Rachel. And so he has his heart fixed on Rachel. And he goes to Laban and says, I want to marry your younger daughter, Rachel. And Laban, who's just as clever as Jacob is, says, okay, but you have to work for me for seven years. Seven years. And Jacob says, deal. I mean, that's how lovesick this guy was. So he works for, I mean, seven years. How many guys in this room did anything for seven years to earn your wife's attention? I know, I know young men in this room who wouldn't wait seven minutes for a girl to text you back, and it would be like, forget it, over. <laughs> seven years, and Jacob works, and then the seven years comes and goes, and actually in one of the more romantic lines in all the scriptures, it says that for Jacob it felt like just a few days. Isn't that so sweet? So the seven years come and go, and uh, Jacob wants to actually marry Rachel now. Now, I have three little girls. My girls are eight, six, and three. And uh, someday they'll be allowed to date. We're thinking like when they're about 35 years old, we'll let them start dating. And uh, someday a young man is going to want to marry them, and he's going to have to find me and ask me. I'll be on the back shed surrounded by guns, and he'll come looking for me. Now, there's a right way and a wrong way in that moment to ask a dad for his daughter's hand in marriage, right? And I just want to suggest to you, young men in this room who will do that someday, do not take Jacob's approach. Here's what Jacob says. In verse 21, it says, Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife. My time is completed, and I want to lie with her. (laughs) That's the tamest translation I could read to you this morning. (laughs) So Laban says, Well, you know, you worked your seven years. All right. And so they have the wedding, and at this time, uh, at this time, weddings were a longer celebration, sometimes a week long, and I don't know how this happened exactly, but of course this is before electricity and it's dark and maybe the bride's face was covered with a veil in the whole time and maybe Jacob had too much to drink. I don't know exactly what happened, but that night uh, they go into the tent uh, to be together and Jacob and who he thinks is Rachel have a wonderful honeymoon evening together, but then he wakes up the next morning and the King James says it the funniest, the King James says, behold, it was Leah. <laughs> So in the daylight, he's like, um, so he takes off running to Laban and says, Laban, I worked seven years for Rachel. It's Rachel that I love, not weak-eyed Leah, and you gave me Leah. And Laban says, oh, I forgot to tell you, we have a custom in our culture. You always marry the oldest daughter off first, but don't, don't worry, you can marry Rachel too. Just work seven more years for me. And Jacob says, all right. Seven more years. Now, he didn't have to wait seven years to actually officially marry uh, Rachel. He just had to work seven more years to kind of earn it. A week later, after marrying Leah, he marries Rachel. And what I think is one of the saddest verses in Scripture is verse 30. It says, Jacob lay with Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. He loved Rachel more than Leah. I know marriage eventually some of the butterflies and some of the excitement wears off but can you imagine a week later your husband is with your younger sister and he loves her more than you anybody else feel for Leah in this story well God notices Leah and it says this in the very next verse it says that when God saw when God noticed when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved he opened her womb but Rachel was barren. Now, this is a big deal in this culture. When they married each other a week apart from each other, I guarantee you it was a race to see who could get pregnant first because, remember, the oldest son would get the lion's share of the blessing. 
So Rachel and Leah both want to get pregnant first, specifically with a son. And God in his mercy looks at Leah and says, she's not loved, I'm going to open up her womb. And Leah doesn't just have one son, but she rips off four sons in a row, while Rachel has none. And she names her sons something that's very, very telling. Her first son's name is Reuben. And Reuben either means or sounds like a Hebrew word that means this. Surely my husband will love me now. Surely my husband will love me now. Then she has another son. His name is Simeon. And Simeon means because the Lord has heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. And then she has a third son. And his name is Levi. And Levi means now at last my husband will become attached to me because I've borne him three sons. Every single one of her first three sons, she named them something that meant now my husband will love me. Maybe he'll love me at least as much as he loves my sister, Rachel. And then verse 35, the story ends like this. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to her son, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah, and then she stopped having children. The worst love story ever. There's a few things we're going to learn together this morning from this story. And um, first, one thing we're going to learn that we might not be that excited to learn is that you and I are not actually that much different than the people in this story. We probably like to distance ourselves from them, from their decisions, from what they've done. But, but we're actually, we actually have a lot in common with them. But the other thing that we're going to learn in this story is that uh, there are two different ways that we actually curse the people in our lives. I don't mean, you know, uh, putting together a string of profanity, but I mean like we curse the relationships in our lives by the way we look at each other. And by curse, I mean we invite pain in. We invite suffering in. So there's two different ways in the story that we see people doing it. But then lastly, we're going to see in the story that there's still hope for the blessing. The blessing is still coming. And so the, the first way that we curse people in our lives is that we see people only as useful. The relationships that we have in our lives, whether it's our children or our spouse or the people that we work with or our neighbors or our friends, we, we reduce them to being nothing more than useful. I, isn't it obvious in this story that people are using people to get certain things? I mean, people are, people are getting used in this story. It's pretty, it's pretty obvious. Here's a few that I noticed. You might even notice more ones. First, Laban uses Jacob. He takes advantage of his lovesickness, and he uses him to get 14 years of free manual labor. Then Laban ends up using Rachel, his youngest daughter, right? He kind of makes her the carrot on the end of the stick to keep Jacob moving forward. Laban also uses Leah. I mean, here here he is. He uses her to get seven more years. He doesn't care what she wants or what her desires are or that she's going to be married to a man who loves her younger sister more than her. He, He uses her. Jacob, although maybe it's not his fault, he was tricked, but he ends up using Leah. He sees her as nothing more than a necessary obstacle to get to what his heart really wants, which is Rachel. And then the last thing in this story is that ultimately Leah, although she's the victim in this story, she ends up using her own sons in the hope that her husband will now love her and accept her. And I don't know that we're that different. I I think that we, if we're honest, we very often look at the people in our lives and we we measure their worth based on what they can do for us, based on how they can help us in our purposes and our agendas. And we're experts at walking into any sort of social setting and immediately evaluating in the room who is worth my time and who isn't worth my time and who's important and who's unimportant. And, and we're very good at that. Some of the questions we ask sometimes is, does this person make me happy? And if they make me happy, then let's keep them in my life. And if they don't make me happy, if they don't make me laugh, if they're not funny, then I don't need them. Does being seen with this person uh, Uh, elevate my social status, my career? Is this person meeting my emotional needs? Is this person meeting my physical needs? Do they make life better for me? Do they support all of my life choices? And so we, we curse relationships and we curse people by seeing them only as useful. And when we use people for our own purposes, there's a few things that we're doing. Number one, we are devaluing and dehumanizing them. We're reducing them from a human who was created in the very image of God who has inherent value as an image bearer, and we're reducing them simply to an object that we use 
to get where we're going. The other thing that we do is we reduce them to being disposable. They're useful while they work. Remember disposable cameras? Years ago we used to use those, remember those? And nobody held on to those afterwards because they're disposable. You don't need them anymore. And so when we see other people as useful, they become disposable to us. So we curse others by making them useful, but we also curse others by making them the ultimate thing in our life, by making another person number one, by making them the thing that our heart adores and, and craves and chases after the most. And of course, it's in the story, right? Jacob makes Rachel his ultimate. 14 years he works for her. And if someone is your ultimate, if you're living for someone else, you'll do anything to have them. You, you'll, you'll, you'll do anything. And then, not only that, but Leah makes Jacob her ultimate. And everything that she does, and even the sons that she produces, is really about earning and, and, and acquiring his love. And if you make someone else your ultimate, not only will you do anything to have them, but you'll use anything to get their attention and to have them. And then, we didn't read it this morning, but Rachel also does something she makes the idea of having children her ultimate also. In the very next chapter, in Genesis chapter 30, in the opening verses, Rachel runs up to Jacob and says, give me children or I'll die. No pressure. <laughs> give me children or I'll die. And that phrase right there gives us so much insight into what happens when we make someone our ultimate. We'd rather not live than have them. We just can't see a, we can't see a way forward we can't imagine a life with meaning and a life with joy if, that, if they're not going to be right there a part of it. And so Rachel makes children her ultimate. And here's the irony of it. Did you, did you notice this now? Rachel has what Leah wants. Leah has what Rachel wants. And neither one of them is happy. Leah has the sons, but not the love of Jacob. Rachel has the love of Jacob, but not the sons. See, it's never enough. When we make someone else our ultimate, we're always looking at others, and we're always comparing ourselves, and we're never really, really satisfied. You know, every single person has something ultimate in their lives. Even if for you this morning, maybe it's not a person, it could be an ideal, or a feeling, or an achievement, or an accomplishment, or something that you've kind of directed your heart towards. This past year, I read a book by a, a Christian philosopher named James K.A. Smith. He's a teacher at Calvin College. His book is called, You Are What You Love. And in it, he says this, to be human, to be human means to be animated by and oriented toward some vision of the good life. What he's saying is every human being finds their energy and their drive and the direction in which they're headed based on whatever that vision of the good life is. Some of us right now, it's it's lunch. That's what's keeping you going, just thinking about lunch or taking a nap this afternoon because you lost an hour of sleep last night. But we all have something out in front of us, the vision of a good life. Maybe it's the future home with three happy children and a, and a husband or a wife, or, or maybe it's that next, maybe it's the corner office in the building that you work in, or maybe it's being known for, for your athletic abilities or your, your art or your music. Every single one of us navigates life with some sort of vision of the good life in front of us, which means every single one of us makes something ultimate. And it's very natural for us to make other people our ultimate and to put our ultimate and deepest hopes in someone else. And what's so dangerous about that is, first off, you're setting up that other person to fail because they can't do that for you. They simply cannot provide for you that sort of like Jerry Maguire scene where it's like you complete me. And so now we're all running around looking for our other half. I think if we just find our other half, we'll, we'll somehow be complete. But we've not been created to really be uh, satisfied with one another. We've been given each other as gifts to give us and to, and to help us understand that we have a desire and a hunger for relationship. But ultimately, we'll only be satisfied in a relationship with a loving, an unconditionally loving God. So it sets other people up to fail, but it also sets yourself up for disappointment because you've placed your hopes in the wrong place. Tim Keller, when he was talking about this passage, he said, if this is the way you live your life, you'll go to bed with Rachel, but you'll always wake up with Leah. You go to bed with Rachel, but you will always wake up with Leah. You'll think you've got something, but in the daylight, you'll realize it's not enough. 
Let me give you some examples. I know this is a series on marriage and relationships, so I want to be a little practical. Let me give you some examples of what happens when we make certain things ultimate in our lives and how it curses our relationships. So first example is this. If the most important thing in your life, if, if, if the, uh, the attention of your mind and the affection of your heart are directed towards being loved and accepted by another person, then if you're unmarried in this room, what it might mean for you, if that's your God, if that's what you love most, if that's what you crave is being loved and accepted, and you're unmarried in this room this morning, what it might mean for you is that any relationship or the idea of any relationship is better than no relationship at all. So you lower your standards. You just, you just don't want to be alone. You just, so literally anybody will do. You got this one requirement, the breathing. Like, and then beyond that, you're like, I'll figure it out. I'm, we'll make it work, right? Because your heart craves being loved and accepted, and you assume I, 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 certainly I'll be happier in a relationship. doesn't even matter who it is than I am not in a relationship. But if you're married and what you crave most is being loved and accepted, then you'll never risk the security of the relationship to be truly honest with the other person. You just won't do it because what you crave most is feeling safe and sometimes it's not always safe to be honest with each other. And the second that you feel like you're not being loved and accepted by your spouse, you'll start looking for it somewhere else. Here's another example. Sometimes what we really want most in life is pleasure and experiences. And so if you're, if you're dating or if you're unmarried and pleasure is your God and it's what you're really living for and it's what you crave most, then you'll just use the other person for your personal pleasure. But you know there's a problem with that. It's called the law of diminishing returns, which means the same thing does not become more pleasurable over time. It becomes less. For example, this week I went to Longhorn Steakhouse where I live in Syracuse, New York, and uh, ordered myself, I don't know why I got a big one, but I got myself a 16-ounce prime rib. And uh, I'll tell you what, the first couple bites, I was in heaven. I mean, I was, I was praising Jesus. I was, like, having a moment. But by the last couple bites of a 16-ounce prime rib, you're just eating because you want to get your money's worth. You're just like, this ain't going to keep well. I ain't taking a doggy bag home. So you're just, like, bearing down and just shoving red meat into your mouth because you just, you're not going to leave the plate, Right? It's called the law of diminishing returns. It doesn't get better. It gets less pleasurable. So if you're dating and you're unmarried and your God is pleasure, well, then you really only have two options when it comes to finding pleasure in another human being. Either you have to keep ramping up what you're doing with that person or you have to find someone else. It just doesn't, it just doesn't satisfy. And by the way, if you're married and pleasure is your God, when the butterflies are gone, when the excitement is gone, when the romance seems to be gone, you'll think, well, I guess this just isn't working anymore because it's just not as exciting as it used to be. And you'll look for that excitement somewhere else. See, this is, this is what happens when we make things our, our ultimate. We, we curse others. We curse our relationships. And we do it by reducing people to either useful or elevating people to being ultimate. And neither one brings the blessing. So how do we get the blessing? Well, you remember Leah names her first three sons something that indicate, I hope my husband loves me and accepts me now. And then something very dramatic, did you pick it up, happens between the third kid and the fourth kid. And it's sort of tantalizing because we don't know what happened, but something happened. Because all of a sudden, Leah says, she has the fourth son, she names him Judah, and she says, this time I will praise the Lord implying she realized in these other moments I had a different Lord. It was Jacob. It was his love. It was his affection. It was his attention. But this time, now I don't know what changed in her heart. I really don't know. But something changes in her heart. She says, this time I will praise the Lord. And she names him Judah, and then she stops having children. Now, she does have more children later eventually. But here's what I want you to notice. Now, I don't know if the author of Genesis knew this, but I know that the author, capital A of Scripture, knew this. Remember we talked about the blessing that went from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob who stole it. Now who should have got the blessing for the 12 sons? It should have been Reuben. He should have got the greatest blessing. And he may have gotten the most land and that sort of stuff. But the real blessing that God was promising us was not land, was not wealth, was not health. The real blessing that God promised Abraham that would bless the world was his son Jesus. You know who Jesus came through? the line of Judah. Through the line of Judah 
comes the person of Jesus. And Jesus is the one who lifts the curse and brings the blessing. In Galatians 3.13, it says that Jesus was cursed so that you could be redeemed from the curse. Now, why would you and I be cursed? And we're not bad people. What have we done? Well, we're cursed because we're lumped in with that covenant that Abraham made with God. And the problem with the covenant is it's conditional. At least, in some ways, it's conditional. God said, I will be your God and you be my people. And as long as we work that out, we'll be good. But guess who's really bad at keeping the covenant? All of us. All of us. We're not covenant keepers. We're covenant breakers. So what hope do we have for the curse to be lifted? Well, there's two things. Number one, Jesus went to the cross where he became cursed in our place. But it's more than that. We didn't just need Jesus to take the curse off of us. We needed him to secure the blessing for us. Well, how could he secure the blessing for us? And here's how he did it. He kept the covenant. He came as you and I, wrapped himself in flesh, and lived the perfect life that you and I should have lived. And his covenant keeping now speaks for us. And so here's one way of understanding the gospel. The gospel is this, that God the Father kept, keeps his promises to you because God the Son kept your promises for you. Let me say it again. God the Father keeps his promises to you because God the Son kept your promises for you. We're not promise keepers. We, we can't keep all our promises. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but every single one in this room has made a promise at some point in their life and not kept it, whether it's to a spouse, whether it's to a friend, whether it's to a coworker, whether it's to a boss. Very often it's the promises you make yourself. A lot of us made, made promises to ourselves on January 1st this year. Jim is very empty all of a sudden. You know, how, 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 is, how is that going? We're not promise keepers, but Jesus came to keep the promise for us so that the Father could keep his promise to us so that the covenant could be uh, fulfilled through Jesus Christ. He came to fulfill the law in all ways. And so he brings us a blessing. So what does this mean? Jesus' life and death is incredibly useful for you. You're running around trying to use other people to pull into your heart the things that Jesus has already provided for you. So Jesus is, in a sense, useful. His life and his death are useful to you. But a lot of you know that what I just said, a lot of you know it and you've heard it your whole life. It's not actually changing your life, though. And here's why. Because Jesus has to be more than just useful to you. He has to become ultimate. He has to be beautiful. Pastor Bob recently recommended a film to me, and he never, I didn't even know that he watched movies. I was like, <laughs> I, was like I thought you just read the Bible all day long. But he, uh, he went... Him and Sue went to see a movie uh, in the theaters recently, and it's called Arrival. Arrival is a science fiction film, and it's, uh, it's actually, if you hate sci-fi, because I'm not a huge sci-fi fan, but it's, it's actually really a brilliant film and, and done very well and, and worth watching. So because Pastor Bob recommended it, I was like, yeah, I'll watch it. So my wife and I got it from Redbox, and we watched it a couple weeks ago, and I loved it. I liked it so much that as soon as the movie was done, I went on Amazon and I found the author who wrote the short story that the movie was based on. And I ordered his book called Stories of Your Life and Others, which is a collection of short stories. His name is Ted Chiang. He's a, he's a Chinese man. He's a brilliant writer. And so I, I read the short story that the movie was based on, but then I read uh, the next story in the collection. It was simply called Hell is the Absence of God. It's a fascinating story, and it takes place in, place in a fictional world that actually is very similar to our world with two very significant distinctions. First off, in this fictional world, angels break in on the world in a destructive way. So not because they want to be destructive, but imagine an out-of-control Superman flying through a city. They just can't land on Earth any other way. So they're just, whenever they show up, one of two things happens to people. People are either killed and injur or injured because of the destruction, or they're miraculously healed of something because of their proximity to the angel. And this happens with frequency in this world. The other thing that's unusual about this world is that when somebody dies, you actually can see their spirit either ascend to heaven or descend to hell. So you know where people go. Well, what happens in the story is a character named Neil, his wife, is killed during an angelic visitation. The angel crashes into a building and shatters the windows, and the glass breaks in such a way that it cuts her, and she bleeds to death. And now Neil is left with this crisis of faith because he blames God for that. God, that was your angel. You came down, and my wife is dead because of the So he hates God. 
But he has a problem. Everybody who was there that day saw his wife's spirit ascend to heaven. And he wants to spend eternity with his wife. So now he's caught in this quandary of, I hate God, but I need to love him to spend eternity with my wife. That's what the whole story is about. And I won't tell you how it ends, but it's fantastic. In the middle of his journey, he meets a man who points out to him something very important that we need to hear this morning. He says, listen, Neil, if you're devoted to God only because you want to be with your wife someday, you do realize you don't really love God most. You love your wife most. And you're simply leveraging or using God to get what your heart most worships and adores and loves, which is your wife. And so he's left with this tension of, are my... And here's what I'm trying to say. For many of us, Jesus has been useful to us our whole lives. He's useful. And so he works for us. He makes us feel happy. He gives us a sense of belonging because he's invited us into a church. Or maybe for some of you, you come because what your heart really adores most is being respected. And so religion is the path to respect, or at least you think. Or maybe some of you, you love power and control, and so being in a church gives you opportunities for ministry and platform and, and, and influence. Or, or maybe what you love most is a feeling of superiority to the other people who aren't in church this morning or who couldn't remember to set their clocks forward last night. And so uh, going to church brings you closer to your vision of the good life, which is being better than other people. And so Jesus is very, very useful for all of those things, but if he's only useful, then your heart's not truly devoted to him. It's truly devoted to that other thing. And Jesus is simply useful. And so we have to move from seeing Jesus as useful to seeing him as beautiful to making him the ultimate. Now, how do we do that? It's the work of the Spirit. I mean, I I can't make that happen for you. You can't even make it happen for yourself. There's things we can do. We can gather together on Sundays and faithfully listen to the teaching of the gospel, the teaching of Scripture. We can fill our lives up with Scripture truth. But ultimately, we have to ask the Spirit, Spirit, help, it, help Jesus not just to be useful to my heart, but help him to become beautiful to my heart in a way that I adore him and worship him. Uh, this last week on CNN, there was a viral video that was going around of a 10-year-old boy who was born with color blindness. He'd never seen certain colors. And scientists have created these sunglasses that you can wear. I don't know if you've heard about this or seen this, but these sunglasses, and if you're colorblind, you put these sunglasses on, and somehow they, they filter out certain uh, rays of light so that people who have never seen color before can all of a sudden see color for the first time. You should go watch this video. It's powerful. This 10-year-old boy goes out to his back deck where his parents have put nine different colored Frisbees out, and he puts these sunglasses on, and he looks at it, and for the first time in his life, he can see red and green and blue and yellow. And he's so overwhelmed that within seconds, he's just weeping. And he turns to his dad, and he buries his face in his dad's chest, and together the dad and son are just weeping together because they're... And so they interview the son afterwards, and the boy said this. He goes, you know, my whole life I've always known what those colors were. I've always known what they were. I've been taught what they were. But I've never seen them before. When Jesus goes from useful to beautiful, you go from knowing to seeing. I think that's what the psalmist means in Psalm 34 when he says, hey, taste, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's one thing to be told something, and it's another thing to taste something. Once you've tasted and seen the goodness of God in your life, you realize, Jesus, thank you for being useful. Thank you for allowing yourself to be used. But more than that, you begin to worship you begin to adore. And here's what happens. As you begin to worship Jesus for who he is, it actually has a way of strengthening and making more healthy your relationships with one another. You're no longer using people to pull into your heart what Jesus has already provided for you, but you're no longer making people the object of your worship because you have a more beautiful object of worship, and his name is Jesus. And that's the blessing that we have. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this truth to our hearts this morning. Holy Spirit, I just pray that in this moment you would do what I am unable to do, that you would seal the truth of these words to the hearts of your people and that you would see much fruit come from it. We love you, we worship you, and we thank you for who you are. Amen. Let's stand together this morning and respond in song.